Calling the uh, special meeting to order of Frontenac Islands. And I'm going to start by pointing out that two of our counselors are zooming in. So we actually do have full forum here today. We'll begin this meeting by acknowledging we are meeting on the land that has been under the stewardship of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Harawinda for time immemorial. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet, live, and play on this land. We thank all generations of Indigenous peoples from the past to the present who currently continue to extend the sharing of this land with us. We recognize and deeply appreciate their ongoing connection to this place. We also recognize the contribution of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples who now make this region their home and who have both shaped and strengthened this community and our province and country as a whole. As settlers, this recognition of the contribution of an ongoing importance of Indigenous peoples to the area must all also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities and to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across our country. Now, is there any disclosure or pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof? Seeing none, hearing none. none. Yep. Was that something, Bob? Nope, I said no. Nope. nope. Okay. Thank you. The purpose of this meeting is going to be Queen's Students Presentation of Maryfield Secondary Plan. I'm going to hand it over to Sonia, who is our planning person from the county. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Um, as the uh, mayor pointed out, my name is Sonia Bolton. I'm the manager of community planning for the county of Frontenac, and our team at the county does the planning services. Uh, for the Township of Frontenac Islands. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, this fall to be able to work with a group of King students uh, with respect to some design standards uh, for Maryville. So the, the six students that have been on the project team um, have done quite a lot of work in a very short amount of time. So they are here this evening to provide a presentation uh, to the public and to council in terms of the work that they did and some of their, their recommendations. Uh, we hope to have the full report uh, available to the public uh, in the new year. So tonight is sort of like a, a sneak peek. Um, so I'll just say, so I see that Nancy, you have put up the, um, is it possible to share from my end? Yeah, I think the students could change the slides themselves, or do you need to do it for Zoom? Sorry, Sonia, the furnace is going here. Did you say share from yours? Yeah, can we share the presentation from this end? Let me see if I can do that, because then the students can just change the slides themselves. Yeah. Oh, so the sharing is disabled, Dylan. Sonia, try and see if you can share from yours. Okay. Yeah, no, it's working now. Uh, I will just bring it up here. Okay. Okay, I'll share the slideshow. <coughs> All right, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the project team. Uh, the presentation should be approximately 30 minutes, and then up to uh, the mayor and the council with respect to questions and answers. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon, I'm the project manager of our student group. Uh, today, we'll be providing an overview of our project, uh, developing design standards for the village of Maryville. Uh, and presenting our recommendations to also. Uh, so before we begin, um, i just like to introduce our project team, uh, which consists of myself, Mike Kelly, Pamela, Grace Pierce, Ivy Liang, uh, Homa Jilly Safarian, and our project supervisor, uh, John Melodrana. Uh, this project was commissioned by the County of Broadback's Planning and Development Department, and our scope uh, was... Oh, and our scope was to undertake a uh, study of design characteristics of Marysville and produce a series of design standards uh, aimed at, uh, uh, aimed at uh, retaining and enhancing the village's uh, rural character. Uh, this uh, uh, project represents an ongoing relationship between the county and the School of Urban and Regional Planning, and so it could not be possible without the support of Sonia Bolton, uh, Joe Gallivan, Dmitry Kurilovich, uh, he worked with us closely throughout this project. Uh, so over the next uh, 30 minutes, we'll be providing a review of our project scope and context. 
um, and discussing the existing policy environment of various scope. So then we into discussing the results of our research from our uh, literature review, case study analysis, and public workshops, and then finished by presenting a sample of our recommended design standards uh, and our closing thoughts. Uh, we'll also provide some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation if you have uh, any questions or comments. Uh, so before we go, uh, go any further, we'd like to just discuss a bit about what rural design standards are. And these can be best understood as a series of policies to help inform uh, the design considerations of new development. Uh, and while this can often touch on elements of architecture, uh, design standards can also focus on designing street groups, uh, uh, open spaces, and other elements of the public and private realm. Um, in a rural context, uh, design standards often seek to preserve rural character and are used as a tool for uh, implementing community objectives. Uh, design standards can also serve as an opportunity to formalize uh, community expectations of development and then be used uh, by uh, developers as a starting point to understand uh, what these expectations are. Uh, design standards are also often developed uh, in consultation with communities uh, and an understanding of local context and are often implemented through zoning, site plan control, uh, and other systems regulated with local uh, So the design standards we're presenting today uh, seek to implement the goals and policies of the Marysville Secondary Plan. And by articulating how these design considerations can help uh, meet these goals, uh, the intent of the report we're producing is to provide a guide for the design of new development uh, in Marysville uh, and provide recommendations for the new zoning for the village. Uh, so to provide a bit of an overview of how these design standards were created, uh, the team used a variety of methods, including site visits, uh, desktop research, and public workshops. Um, using these results, a design framework was then created, uh, which outlined a vision, guiding principles, and goals for these new design standards. And then using this design framework, uh, case studies in the literature were then assessed for best practices and supplemented by contextual analysis and workshop recommendations uh, to produce a collection of uh, final design standards. Uh, so at this point, I'd just like to walk through some of the context analysis performed by our team. Uh, and how this uh, structured our design standards going forward. Uh, so through a combination of uh, site visits and digital mapping, uh, the, the team analyzed 179 parcels across 37 uh, design characteristics uh, to form a site inventory of uh, each lot within Marysville. This information from the site inventory was then used uh, to map design features uh, in areas uh, across the village neighborhood. Uh, and this was used to identify trends in the village's overall design character. Uh, so the first component of our site inventory were lot level characteristics. Uh, so these related to uh, uh, the lots themselves and were measured in GIS uh, using the definitions of the township's uh, zoning bylaw. Uh, the second component were structural characteristics uh, relating to the principal buildings on each lot. Uh, and these included uh, design elements such as building style, uh, and the arrangement of doors and windows as a few examples. Um, the third component we looked at were non-structural characteristics related to the lots themselves. Uh, and here we looked at elements such as the provision of landscaping uh, and uh, different types of fencing. And finally, the, the fourth component of our inventory, we're looking at streetscapes. And here we paid attention to uh, the provision of parking, uh, different streetscape amenities, uh, and the features. Uh, so using this information, uh, three areas were defined based on the design typologies, uh, as well as their constraints for design, and these included the village core, uh, existing neighborhood, and the future neighborhood. Uh, Uh, so the village core represents a higher density area of the village with smaller lot sizes and larger lot coverages, uh, and also provides a mix of commercial and residential uses, which creates uh, a varied streetscape in the village. Uh, however, a big constraint of this area is uh, the underdeveloped waterfront connections, uh, as well as narrow sidewalks, which uh, limit uh, tourism and other forms of development. Uh, the existing neighborhood was the second area we identified. Uh, which is a lower density part of the village with mostly single detached houses uh, and some institutional uses. Uh, the consistency of uh, architectural style here uh, helps to define the village's rural character. 
but a constraint is also that buildings and uh, road right of ways uh, limit the creation of walking pool paths, especially to uh, the new expansion area. Uh, turning to that new expansion area, uh, well, it's uh, currently mostly uh, made of uh, fields. It's planned to be the, the new residential area of the village with some supporting commercial and institutional uses. Um, as part of this land is donated, there's an opportunity to develop it uh, with attention to the goals of the secondary plan close in mind. Uh, however, as a condition of the donation, uh, a bypass road uh, will need to be considered for future planning endeavors. And so by defining uh, these areas, their challenges and opportunities, uh, this helps us to assist in identifying considerations uh, that are design standards should uh, seek to address. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Cam now uh, to explore the policy context of theirs. Thank you, Simon. So one of our first steps alongside the site context of literature review was a review of all relevant uh, policy documents. We started with the broad overarching policy, the potential policy statement from 20, which has lo uh, long term provincial goals and uh, then move down to the other plans, the zone bylaw, and of course, the most, the most important, the Marysville secondary plan. Uh, starting with PBS, we focused on section one, which we kill building strong, healthy communities. Uh, and we looked at key policies related to uh, creating sustainable communities. This includes providing a range and mix of housing types. Uh, we'll save questions for the end. I just want to speak to a little more slowly. Slowly? Sure, I can do that. Oh, so, um, Again, accommodating for appropriate range and mix of housing types and uh, tenure was an important policy, as were policies for active transportation and uh, related to uh, mitigating impacts of climate change. Moving on to the County of Rolling Act Plan, focused on the six themes of sustainability that are present within that of economic sustainability, growth management, community building, housing and social services, heritage and culture, and environmental sustainability. Uh, the main areas of concern for the future growth and development, and would influence some of our design standards and themes uh, later on in our research. Next policy statement or policy we focused on was the Township of Conhack Island's official plan. Uh, we read that the Township wants to create a strong community identity that reflects the uniqueness of the Frontenac Islands. A uh, historical and cultural context of the Frontenac Islands helps us establish the geology of the village to borrow a term from the Camp Fernie workshop. The document also highlights some of the challenges that Wolf Island faces, such as an aging population, lack of housing options, and the risk of fragmentation of isolated farmland that Wolf Island is well known for. Then finally, moving on to the Marysville Secondary Plan, it's the most relevant and recent document related to the future of Marysville. Uh, and it contains information about the anticipated growth, the need for about 300 uh, expected population uh, to move to Wolf Island over the next 25 years, and this should be accommodated in 157 residential units. Roughly, uh, as the core need for the secondary plan and the need for the expansion area. Uh, contains the vision goals uh, from the secondary plan were adopted and expanded on for the vision statement of the design standards. And uh, the later the, the statement, vision, and goals of the secondary plan also helped greatly inform our own themes and what the design standards are centered around. We also referenced the Township of Long Island's zoning bylaw. Look at what is present in the village, what types of uses are acceptable, and some provisions to help uh, guide some of the recommendations. We all have heard building code after what we could actually say, and then looking at the community permanent planning system for a way to implement this as one of the possible avenues. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Ivy, who will talk about our literature review and case studies. All right, so now that we've gone for our academic literature review, the purpose of this is to provide a foundation of existing research knowledge, ensuring that recommendations are informed through a thorough understanding of concepts, theories, challenges, and issues in rural areas that would affect the creation of our design standards. So in total, we reviewed 15 books and journal articles about rural design and 36 journal articles and government documents on communal services. Um, we found that for rural design, it was important to, during the planning creation process to provide explicit links between design recommendations and goals, as well as consulting with the community throughout the process. Within the standards themselves, academic literature also stated that it's important to define and protect each area of rural character, which we've done so in our final report. And as for communal servicing, we found that communal servicing can reduce the cumulative amount of land that would be required for setbacks on lot sizes on normal individual servicing. This would allow for multi-unit dwellings and other non-residential uses that would normally require larger, larger capacities. Um, this form of servicing can also put less strain on agricultural land and properly treat wastewater. So these results were used to inform the creation of the design framework, the selection and review of case studies, as well as the format of the public workshop. 
I think if I did, oh. it wouldn't let me go back. Okay, I got it. Okay, well, that will that, 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 that move on to the case study analysis. Um, so a total of 55 case studies were gathered and analyzed using the evaluation framework. A variety of geographical locations were selected, including towns across Canada, uh, the Europe, US, Europe, and New Zealand. So some were general design standards. However, we also analyzed specific design standards focused on waterfronts, employment areas, streets, commercial, mixed use, and affordable housing guides to inform specific needs within our design framework. So we ranked each of these design standards and chose the top 20 highest ranking cases to directly inform our design standards. And some of the highest ranking cases that we decided to draw from included the town of Caledon, Ontario, town of Monaghan in Ireland, St. Albans neighborhood in North Carolina, and the city of Dover in New Hampshire. So as shown in highly ranked cases in our literature review, community involvement during the creation of the standards was a key to success. So now I'll turn it to Mike to speak to our community workshop. Thank you. So I'll start off this section by thanking council and the mayor for the use of the town hall to conduct two workshops which took place on February 7. Further thanks to uh, the councillors and the mayor who attended the workshop in person, as well as all the residents who came out and gave us their feedback, of which was roughly third. So we had three main goals for this workshop. First was to understand how residents perceive and define the character of Marysville. The second was to identify key areas and locations of the village and their defining characteristics. And the third was to identify residents' desired futures for Marysville and the expansion area. So as residents arrived at the workshop, we asked them the broad question, what is most important about Marysville? This was intentionally left open-ended to gain their most instinctual answers. These answers were written in sticky notes and plastered across a map of Marysville on the wall. This got people thinking about the current state of Marysville and gave us a snapshot of opinions of the populace prior to any prompting. After this, the residents mingled for a bit, picked up some refreshments, sat down at tables together to commence most formal exercises. This began with a visioning exercise intended to find the perception of the future of Marysville, prompted with the question, where do you see Marysville in 10 to 20 years? Their hopes, aspirations, fears, and reservations were all expressed. We wanted to know where people thought things were headed in the village and determine what future they wanted them to head towards. We then moved on to a photo questionnaire Residents were shown a series of photos three at a time and asked to comment on various factors related to them. These photos were loosely organized into the categories you see on screen here. And the photos were of many different locations around the world intended to provide a range of features, both attractive and not so much, through which to comment on. To jumpstart the conversations, we prompted with questions such as, how well would these fit into Marysville? How do they make you feel? Would you be happy to see this, et cetera? We recorded all these answers as we went along, and each group then took some time and synthesized all the information, the most important characteristics, and then presented them to the group. So ultimately, we learned a lot from these exercises, but some key takeaways were a strong interest in protecting the current character of the village. There was little interest in changing the village in any way, in particular in allowing development, which would cause it to become unrecognizable. The residents in particular paid much attention to building features, including heights, facades, and maintaining the eclectic nature of the village. In line with this, they rejected the idea of cookie cutter development, instead wishing for many unique building forms and preserving safety on the roadways was another high priority. With all this information gathered, we began drafting our design standards. Thank you, Mike. In the next 15 minutes, we're getting to the, I guess, meat and bones of this presentation. We're presenting a sample of our design standards. We have about 12 prepared, but there are over 300 uh, total. But before that, we have guiding principles. This is based on our research in policy review, literature review, some of the case studies. And there came up with six guiding principles based on the vision statement. Uh, the first being preserving the unique village character. So, Marysville is a unique rural community. It's located on an island. Not too many others like that in Ontario, as many as our as well. Uh, with the collective range of housing styles and is free from suburban development. New development should be consistent with this existing rural character and rural traffic of the village in order to maintain the nature of what Marysville is. Second is promoting an active, uh, sorry, a safe, inclusive, and attractive community. The design standards should seek to make the community safer and more inclusive. Uh, issues such as street lighting and better uh, sidewalks and walkways to help, I think, no longer help improve this, allow people to get around more easily, no matter what ability they have. The third one is supporting walkability and connectivity. 
Uh, when you upgrade the ferry, it's more uh, readily accessible for pedestrians to make use of the Marigold that is, you know, both locals can uh, more easily walk around and as well, you know, tourists from Kingston can get on the ferry and hop over. And having an improved pedestrian network can go a long way to uh, improving the accessibility of the village. The fourth one is uh, integrating the development thoughtfully. So one of the big things we heard from the workshop was that they didn't want the expense area to be a separate town. They wanted to be a commuter community uh, for you know, workers in Kingston that just coming to sleep and move on an island. They wanted it to be more of Marysville. So any new development could match the uh, lot fabric, the uh, grid pattern of the streets from that historic uh, Ontario development that you see so many towns. There is that you know, a small grid and kind of preserve it and maintain it in the expansion area. The fifth guiding principle is about fostering sustainability, efficiency, and adaptability uh, from, from some not from areas uh, from Wolf Island. The windmills are a land up and they're driving by. And we represent that switch to a green energy and a green economy. Uh, and you know, preserving this through or enhancing this through green infrastructure, through uh, other sustainability, you know, sustainable design of buildings, uh, including energy efficient design, is a long way to furthering these goals and mitigating against climate change. And our sixth guiding principle is responding to the needs of the village, its residents, and developers. So looking at the you know, need to accommodate 300 additional residents, uh, making sure that residents don't feel out of place from uh, new development, they don't feel isolated or you know, forgotten. And of course, developers do need uh, an incentive to be here. And part of the reason the design standards exist is that they come in ahead of time and see what's expected of them, then produce plans and not have to uh, you know, get denied over and over again and appeal and waste time and money. With that, we're going to move on to, I'm uh, sorry, we have four themes that each of the design centers adhere to. So uh, character and identity, this is the, you know, once again, that eclectic mix of styles, the, uh, you know, the different lot sizes, the different housing types, the historic range of housing styles from, you know, 100, 200 years plus of settlement. Uh, our second theme is vibrancy and inclusivity. This includes, you know, street art and public spaces that uh, Mary's residents can be proud of. Number three, so once again, sustainability, making sure that Mitigating against the impact of climate change and also making sure that Marisville will last for 200, 300 more years. Dominance. And number four is accessibility and connectivity. Once again, making sure that you know, pedestrians can get around. And also, that the open space network is better connected, there's better trail systems and similar features to improve the quality of life for Marisville residents. That's going to move on to the design standards. They are, as I said before, in 13 themes. You can see at the top of the category, the number of standards. There are about over 300 total. First, uh, they'll go through the themes, let's, uh, you know, the categories real quick. Their building style, mixed use, uh, building form, streets and active transportation, gateway areas, lighting, signage, open space, uh, waterfront areas, green infrastructure, landscaping, parking, and uh, site layout. So we're going to be going, presenting just 12 of them right here. So we have the theme at the top. The standard itself, the intention of it, with a few samples, sometimes from Marysville, sometimes from other communities, sometimes both. Uh, at the bottom, we can see which area this design standard applies to. We've got this middle core, the main street, the existing neighborhood, so other streets around it, or the future neighborhood in the expansion area. Uh, first one I'm going to present is building style. So, provide a very compatible architectural style for sense of place and to create interesting streetscapes. As I said before, the eclectic range of housing styles is national. Uh, Cape Cod, uh, post war housing, uh, Ontario got to buy the economy from the 1800s. All this mix contributes to the unique rural character of Marysville. And you can see we have a few examples from around town. Sorry, the houses there, but you have the good example. So uh, any new house should kind of match this range. It shouldn't be, you know, suburb. It shouldn't be the same house copied 20 times down the street. It should be unique and create a visual uh, interest on the street. Second one I'm going to present is once again on building style, more looking at the shape and structure, architectural style, scale, massing, uh, and detailing building should be compatible with the prevalent in the neighborhood. There's a you know, historic mix of buildings. We have a few pictures here um, received from the uh, Wolf Island Historical Society about you know, some of those historic buildings, old churches, uh, the Bible churches, Italian style, uh, matri buildings, and this keeping buildings the same size makes them not look out of place or and to improve general compatibility. Number three is about mixed use development. There are a few mixed use developments within the community already. Uh, so, commercial mixed use development must be pedestrian oriented and minimal setbacks, uh, except for the purpose of enhancing pedestrian street level appeal. 
So uh, that just means that you know you work with an tree along the sidewalk so that pedestrians can walk by and see what's inside and see that there is activity on the street. Instead of having to you know, have a parking lot and have to look beyond that, it uh, also you know is what is present already. You see a few examples here. Uh, we have Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the commercial units are right along the uh, street. Uh, you know, same in Corning Harkin. And then here, for example, the Wolfile Hotel is uh, you know, has a patio and the porches are right against the street and you know it enhances that pedestrian street level appeal. The last one I'm going to present is about building form. So mixed use multi unit buildings shall be designed to have a distinct base, middle, and top to create visual interest. This is what begins differentiating mixed use buildings with a commercial use of a mixed use building and the residential units above. And this provides more of the visual interest and makes the street more appealing. Yeah, as you can see from Fort Perry, uh, another example from Perry, you have on the bottom floor a commercial unit with paneling, large window, but then above it you have residential units with brick and a smaller window for privacy. And this mix helps differentiate different uses and uh, is more in line with what's present in Marysville itself. And next, I'm going to pass it on to Ivy. We'll talk about the next set of design standards. All right. So, this section provides guidance on the design and elements supporting pedestrian safety and physical accessibility. So, an important infrastructure component of our design standards are pathways and sidewalks. So, we want to ensure safe pedestrian crossings across particular routes particularly ensuring that new development was able to provide safe, active transportation options and complete missing links in the existing pathway and sidewalk network. So this included using different paving materials or colors to enhance the safety and aesthetic appeal of the crossings, as suggested by the City of Northampton design manual. And as seen in the picture on the bottom right, there were several examples we noticed in which disconnected pathway networks can be completed, which directly connects to our theme of accessibility and connectivity and providing a well-connected network and hierarchy of paths throughout the village. So next is streets and active transportation. So biking facilities is an important mode of transportation and activity by both residents and visitors on the island. So it was important to us that we made safe and enjoyable bike facilities. In particular, we wanted to ensure bike lanes at intersections were safe and protected for bike users to encourage further active transportation throughout the community. So this would include intersection crossing markers as well as using colors along roadways to ensure that drivers were communicating with bikers as suggested by the city of Northampton as well. And while individuals biking along roll shoulders is the most common as on the Wolf Island that's seen through our workshop, um, we aim to improve the safety of active transportation options through these design standards, which is reflective of the accessibility and connectivity. So another important feature we decided to highlight is gateway areas. So we proposed four gateway areas in Marysville that we mapped out in our report to have distinct wayfinding and branding elements, such as signage, historical displays, or public art. So connecting to our goals of character and identity, as well as vibrancy and inclusivity, we want to ensure that gateways of Marysville were highlighted, as well as provide the neighborhood with visible indications of important notes in the area. So the picture in the bottom right corner is an example of a current historical mural present in Marysville, as opposed to a current gateway area that we would want to highlight and emulate throughout the village and include signage similar to Thomas Park, Indiana, as seen in the top picture. So we also want to ensure that lighting in the village core is safe, accessible, and blends with the existing character of the area. So this aligns with one of our character and identity goal of creating focal points in the village core, as well as emphasizing the importance and informative nature for visitors and residents of life. So the picture on the bottom right is a group of wayfinding signs that is directly across from the ferry dock, which follows the style of the picture that we use to guess, but does not provide any lighting of which it would greatly benefit from. So by enhancing wayfinding and establishing importance of such near the ferry terminal, um, this would be crucial in our character and identity goal of making the village more accessible and informative for visitors. We'll move on to signage and wayfinding with an eye towards design. So the stand, we drafted the standard that signs should enhance and complement the design of the associated building. Hanging signs, ground-related signs, and signs integrated into a building's facade are encouraged. Signs mounted on rooftops are discouraged. Signs mounted on single poles are discouraged with the exception of traffic-related signs. It is our intention that signage should be complementary to a building's form and enhance its presence rather than simply draw attention to it. This concept can be seen in two local examples where the sign for the whip is integrated onto the facade, accentuating the building's design rather than dominating it. We see another example in this in the sign for the blue moose, which though separated from the building, still fits into the true character and utilizes the site. Move on to open space. Open space is an important component of this community. As such, we have established a standard that public open spaces 
should seek to incorporate an appropriate range and variety of active and passive recreational uses for a variety of ages and abilities. Public open spaces should consider including continuous portions of flexible hard space for public gathering and events. It is our intention that open spaces provide space for recreation and well being for all those who use them. As such, attention should be paid to ensure that they are designed for and accessible to all members of the community. We can see some local examples here with the expansive sports fields and covered ice service at the community center, as well as the children playground attached to the school, allowing, allowing for varying forms of recreation for people with different recreational interests and abilities. It lends itself nicely to the next category of waterfront. Being located on an island, the waterfront is a very prominent part of this community, though it is currently quite underused and mostly under private ownership. As such, we recommend that the township is strongly encouraged to seek opportunities where possible to develop the waterfront areas into public open spaces. The intention is that this will increase the usable space on the waterfront for the community. Ideally, this would include the development of docks to serve as some form of public marina, with the inclusion of green space area to serve as a nice area for locals, as well as a draw for people from outside of the community without congesting the ferry or roadways. Obviously, this is a very long-term goal, but one that should be striven towards. We can see an example of areas similar to this already downtown with the dock behind the Wolf Island Grill and there's picnic table. And in line with the community's commitment to sustainability, we have green infrastructure. Our intention is to build upon Wolf Island's existing and environmentally conscious character by promoting development practices which maintain and preferably enhance the quality of the natural environment. With this in mind, we have drafted the standard that sustainable site and building design and construction techniques and new development that reduce energy and water consumption and improve air quality, water quality, and waste management are encouraged. And the use of recycled materials is encouraged. It's in line with our sustainability theme by creating infrastructure which is efficient long term without causing undue harm to the natural environment. You can see examples here of some green infrastructure in the form of bioswales and rain gardens in Toronto and Virginia, respectively. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, we also recommend that landscaping not only serve a decorative function, uh, but also provide a mitigating function on visual impacts. Um, especially in commercial and institutional areas, uh, landscaping can help assist in providing a cohesive and engaging uh, facades and street streetscapes, uh, which otherwise would be interrupted by uh, loading areas with utility elements, which can uh, impact on the rural character. Uh, because of that, we recommend a strategic use of landscaping uh, to screen or conceal uh, these types of visual impacts. Uh, with meet goals uh, for uh, increasing vibrancy of the village as, and as well as providing uh, additional greenery throughout. Uh, in a similar manner, uh, while we uh, well, we heard from uh, the workshops that parking is an important goal uh, for the, the building residents. Uh, it can also create a visual impact, which can uh, weaken pedestrian experiences. Um, and so where possible, we recommend that parking for non-residential uses uh, be located to the rear of buildings uh, through creative site layouts, um, or separated through changes in surface materials or additional landscaping. Uh, we have an example here in the village of the Wolf Island uh, Post Office, which has an unobtrusive facade that blends uh, nicely into the uh, into the village streetscape, um, uh, but also allows it to screen a substantial uh, parking area in the building's uh, rear area. Uh, these principles for parking can uh, also apply to residential uses. Uh, and so to reduce the prominence of driveways in new and existing uh, building areas, we recommend that garages be located to the rear of buildings or have a substantial setback from the lot line. Uh, and while this standard can also meet goals for uh, creating more positive pedestrian experience, uh, the main intent here is to also emulate the current parking arrangement in the village uh, to be seen in some of these examples. Uh, this would also help to avoid building forms uh, with front garages, uh, which could create a suburban rather than rural feel for the village. Um, and finally, for our last uh, design standard we're going to share with you today uh, is related to site layout. Um, and because Marysville has been developed on individual water and wastewater services, 
The resulting spatial form of the village uh, consists of large lot sizes and setbacks uh, to deal with the spatial constraints uh, of these types of systems. Uh, and so a new development in the expansion area where the preferred form of servicing is uh, communal services, uh, development should uh, therefore consider opportunities uh, that this type of servicing provides, uh, such as sorry, um, such as uh, reduced lot sizes and higher density uh, compared to those available on individually distributed plots. Uh, these changes in lot layout can also provide uh, opportunities for enhanced environmental uh, conservation, while also increasing the total number of units on the same land, uh, which can help to balance uh, uh, environmental and development goals at the same time. Um, and so to provide a summary of the work we've accomplished uh, through the design standards project, we'd like to provide some closing uh, uh, comments on the scope of our final report and how it can be used by council going forward. Um, so as the basis for uh, understanding design characteristics, uh, the site inventory can be a useful resource for the township, especially for analyzing and communicating the fit of new developments uh, across the indicators we've analyzed here. Uh, through the workshops, uh, we also uh, captured uh, important feedback from residents related to their desired futures for Marysville and how they see the role of design uh, for helping to achieve this vision. Uh, and finally, in addition to the standards uh, highlighted today, uh, this, uh, the report we're producing contains over 300 additional and supporting standards, which are meant to achieve the goals of the design framework we've outlined, as well as the goals of the Mary School Secondary Plan. Uh, and so in summary, the report provides a valuable resource to the township by providing a series of recommendations informed by both local context and community input for preserving and enhancing uh, the unique character of Mary School. Uh, and so we recommend that council consider the contents of our final report uh, as the township develops uh, new zoning for the village. Uh, the final report uh, will be available uh, at the start of the new year uh, and will incorporate feedback we received today, uh, as well as be uh, finalized in coordination with planning staff uh, at the county front. Uh, but with that, we'd like to uh, end by thanking council and the mayor for their time today and engagement throughout this project, uh, as well as the county for their continued support. Uh, and we'd be happy to uh, take any questions at this time. So thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. All your effort you've put into this project, we really appreciate that. Your communication with all of your residents that showed interest in it. And now I'll ask the counselors first. If there's any questions, Councilor Javonica? I have to echo the same sentence as the mayor. Outstanding job and presentation on your feedback and the information provided. Really well detailed. Pretty impressive. You can see it. Question that is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a building guy too, always curious. Like, was there a size comparison? You're talking about 2,000 square foot homes, 1,500 square foot homes. Um, just an idea of the size of how you see you over the interior. Um, yeah, part of the, thank you for the question, um, part of uh, the scope of our project was uh, not to focus as uh, as uh, as detailed in terms of uh, square footages or lot frontages or kind of the very specific dimensions. Uh, so we, we kind of uh, uh, don't have a, a solid answer for you, um, but the kind of, as we've been writing, writing the design standards, the focus has been on uh, translating those kind of considerations around uh, what those spatial dimensions, uh, what intent they have for guiding development in the village. Uh, so, for example, uh, in terms of uh, lot sizes, something we noticed was that, um, uh, you know, in the village core, lot sizes are kind of typically smaller, uh, while in the existing residential area, they tend to get a bit bigger to accommodate. Um, uh, like a, a detached house versus in the village core, um, like a mixed use sort of commercial building. Um, so that's kind of, as we've been writing the design standards, that's kind of an example of thinking about, um, you know, applying it to the expansion area where you uh, will have uh, both kind of medium density and lower density forms, uh, trying to emulate the current patterns uh, of the village core in the existing residential areas into the uh, new development, so. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just going to ask about if the council is interested in what kind of numbers we get for work 
working on this only we could go through MPAC data in, in GIS and future and other than ours. I'm going to say that the average square footage of, of a home here in, in the current existing village is probably, um, you know, smaller than the, the current standard you're seeing built elsewhere, which would just, just given the age of, of the building plot that is here. So, yeah, so I would say probably around 1500 is probably a relatively you know, decent guess in terms of the square footage, but, but we can certainly check that number um, when it comes to doing that, the new zoning for the village as well. Great, great. One more question of mine. Um, just curious about the height as well. Is anything about multi story buildings, one story, story two story, anything higher than that? What would your recommendation on the height? Yeah, I can't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, again, we'll cover here because it's a bit more of a, you know, an exciting design standard, but it is based on the variable secondary plan. It does say uh, two story and a three story down below, current steps guesting, two stories in the village core and existing neighborhoods. And then three story potential amount everywhere, but maybe one or two buildings in the expansion area. This will allow them to have potential views of Lake Ontario still. There is a potential for that to change where you know, downtown could have three stories as well all along Main Street, but uh, you know, two stories and then three stories in the expansion area is the main recommendation. But it's more uh, in the zoning model, I suppose, will work. It's just our recommendation based on case studies and what's present in the build right now. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no real questions for me. Just uh, echo what they say. It's a great presentation. You guys did a great job, and I can't believe how well you presented it. Thank you. I wish I could. Thank okay, you, Councillor Saunders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll just reiterate what everybody else has said. This is a, a phenomenal amount of work. I do really appreciate it. Um, I lived in Prince Edward County and there was a neighborhood called Rossmore. And without a design plan, what happened with that neighborhood, which was a bunch of basically old cottages and village, um, fishing villages, it it everything was haphazard per se. So I think presenting some design standards for us will help us move forward. Um, we have decisions to make around funding and all that kind of stuff. So having that picture out there will help us. Um, uh, the developments I see these days tend to be mixed developments. So there's single family, uh, uh, multi-story, uh, um, what's the term, uh, design built housing and stuff. So did you take that into consideration when you think about the new development area? Um, yeah, I think uh, we, we did consider it a little bit. We One of the things we recommended as part of the design standards were um uh to have to encourage a variety of housing styles so uh we certainly we got feedback from uh, the workshops where people uh you know talked about having prefabricated houses or like tiny homes as uh, an option uh or specifically providing affordable housing uh, so that was something we considered as we were kind of drafting the design standards um yeah the uh, the other thing we also kind of paid attention to though was you know uh avoiding kind of the cookie cutter development was kind of a, a big uh uh a prominent goal for us um and so it's something we kind of did through the design standards with trying to uh uh imitate sort of the organic and eclectic kind of growth and character that marysville and a lot of other rural areas are uh characterized by um, so we have certain provisions for thinking about um, how do you bear uh, like lot frontages or uh, lot setbacks within sort of a, uh, a feasible range to kind of uh, imitate that that uh, sense of uh, even if houses might uh, look similar um, and if they're kind of like people prefabricated um, how do they like through kind of like lot layout or uh, landscaping or, or any of the other kind of elements we've looked at, um, how to use those to sort of uh, make it feel as if it's kind of been there for a very long time. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if that is. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ackley. Yeah, I just basically like to say it was a great presentation, and uh, I don't really have any uh, big questions like it's. We mentioned the word sustainability an awful lot in here. And isn't it going to hinder the ferry a little bit with 157 new units coming and the builds and all that stuff? So we're going to wreck the sustainability for the 
traffic for the ferry to come on and off and the islanders. So how are we going to adjust to that? I didn't hear anything mentioned about that part of the deal in there. For you, Madam Mayor, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that question if I could. It, it's really outside the scope of what the students are, are looking at. I mean, I know we're still all waiting for the new ferry and waiting for the new dock. Um, so this is just coming on if and or when that new development happens, how it should fit in. Um, I fully expect that council will be having lots of future conversations about traffic and traffic patterns and sustainability. So yeah, it was a little bit outside the scope of, of what the students were looking at. I think their focus on sustainability was, you know, making the village as walkable as possible so that when you're here, you don't need a you don't need a vehicle when you're in the village. And also um, looking at opportunities both on the public and private side of things for incorporating things like green infrastructure, energy efficiency, and, and those kinds of things for developments. Thank you. Okay. And just to echo on Councillor Axon's point that the whole concept of the Marysville Secondary Plan was predicate on the transportation study of 2011 that indicated dual ferry service and future bridge. So at this point in time, with our Wolf Islander 4 eventually, soon, getting into service, if it were the only ferry, it would just be enough to deal with the current population that lines up over an hour before, before they can get off of the island. <clears throat> and that's why it's crucial. Crucial to have the transportation in place because we have uh, artificial stranglehold in transportation, which is real. It's a safety concern for paramedic services. It's a real concern for anybody trying to work and be employed on the mainland. Where years ago we were almost purely agricultural, and you'd have very few trips to town. That's not the case anymore. Even the nature of the agriculture allows for a lot of people to work in town at the same time. So the Marysville Secondary Plan was uh, built basically on the concept of having superior transportation solutions. So it truly does tie back to the Ministry of Transportation. And that's why back at the AMO conference in August, in our presentation package, I also had a copy of Marysville Secondary Plan in it when we're talking about fairies. I said, we can't have this if we don't have that. And it's that crucial. So we can make lots of great plans, but we have to have the support of provincial government. And if they're being cautious about it, and as they said, you know, there's a shortage of seafarers and there's a, a cost associated. I said, shortage of seafarers we can work on, but the cost, you already knew it. It was in the, the plan. But if you're backing away from that in any way, shape, or form, it's going to directly impact us, which is very disappointing. That if we've got two schools, three churches, wonderful community, we're ready to meet the call. But we need to have our transportation. But we do appreciate everything that you have done. There's one, one point that caught my eye early on, and that was the mapping of the Marysville. And it had the existing roadway to the east on the 7th. And it's actually part that has never been opened up. So you had it marked down as streets. Those are imaginary streets. They've never been opened up. There is no secondary road from Mary's from the seventh line road coming back in to Marysville. So there's lots that can still be done. And if we get more good faith and real action from the provincial government and that this is the sort of stuff that we can turn around and say, yes, yeah, we're ready. We've got uh, the plans in place. We've got the zoning in place. We may have developers that come along, and we certainly have land as township in that, and there seems to be opportunity to actually get involved in building homes or at least allowing for affordable homes to be created. <clears throat> but it's so disheartening in that when you look at it from a transportation perspective, because it really is vital 
and that, but it does not dissuade anything. It doesn't take away anything from your work, that which is wonderful. I'm looking forward to the final report of it. And maybe we'll, by that point, have a, a firmer commitment from the Ministry of Transportation to provide us with the dual ferry service that they promised, in which case we'll be in the cat bird seat for moving ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to offer, are there any questions from the audience at this point in time? And if there are, just stand up, tell us your name and where you live. Yes? Yeah, I'm Diane Kelly, and I've participated in the workshops, which were really, really valuable. And I think you picked up on a lot of concerns that at least my table had. And, and one of the issues I'm curious about is one of the last slides you showed and you're recommending that the uh, garages be at the back. We had we had recommended something even maybe a little more dramatic, which was to have access access roads around the back and have the houses look into a green space. Now I don't know whether that's not practical practical because you're trying to fit as many houses into as much space as you can, but and maybe that's pipe dream stuff, but it sounds to me like it would be quite unique and, and quite lovely. So it's just it's just taking the garages in the backyard and expanding that vision just a little bit. And and may we get copies of your slides? Um, there are a few in circulation. Uh, I think that we don't share the link. So what I would have to do is, and I believe Jenny, you're probably on the uh, email list. So we are going to um, we're going to upload these presentations from today uh, to the Engage Front Net website, and we'll still work with the clerk because I understand now you're, you're putting uh, recordings of your meetings on the YouTube channel. So when I have the link for all of that, hopefully in the next few days, I'll send out another email to the contact group so everybody can have. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Stand up, say your name, where you live, please. And speak up so the Alec can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My name is Martin Example in, in the case studies that you selected from Australia, Europe, USA, and Canada, how did you filter them? And would you would you perhaps maybe even give one or like I, you mentioned four in particular um, model case studies that we might learn from? Um, yeah, I'm just like so. Did that methodology inform you? Or did and the other question was, did the methodology also um, form the basis of the public participation? Or was that separate? So um, we had a pretty large evaluation framework on how we want to evaluate all the 55 cases that we collected. And so we wanted to focus on planned content. So if they included like good design standards on active transportation or sustainability, but also how they were formed. So um, if they had included public participation or the legibility of the plan. So we scored each of the plans based on those like multiple categories and criteria. And um, we ranked each of them out of, I think like 215 and they got a score. And then we picked the top 20 of those cases so that our design standards directly focused on good examples of case studies. And um, for the public participation, we also focus on the, especially the photo questionnaires that we gave out about ranking the photos and how people felt about them. We got them directly from a lot of different methodologies suggesting that it was um, good to have our like broad visioning exercise from the beginning with the post-it notes, but also have kind of details about building form and how people felt about those. But um, all the methodology, all that stuff is all in our that we yeah. yeah, through email addresses, when the report's published, what we'll probably look to do is like staff will need to read through it at the beginning of January, and then we'll probably present it formally to council with a request that we that you uh, direct us to post it online, and we can leave it up there, and, and certainly you know over the course of say a few weeks, let the public have a look at it, submit it, and feedback. 
uh, to us because it'll be the first chance that they get to have a look at it. But but again, another email will go out in the new year when, when the full report is finished. And, and it's, uh, it's it's a very healthy report. So so those who are looking forward to reading it, be careful what you wish for. I've been promised a healthy number of indices as well. So so there could be lots of lots of detail if there's a specific aspect of their work, like the methodology that you're interested in. Um, that there there should be that, that detail. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay. All right. Seeing none, I'd like to again thank you for all your work. It was very impressive, and I look forward to seeing the full report as well as the reference. I always like to look at the references from that because it's always informative, and then I can check on anything. And now I'd like to ask if I could have a mover and a seconder for the special meeting of the council to adjourn. Councillor Fulton, Councillor Jablonicki, any discussion? All those in favor, people on Zoom, please say yay or nay. Yay. Yay. Carried. Adjourned at 6 5 to 5. 16 55. Thank you very much. Thank you.